Hello, my name is Alex, and I am 14 years old. Since my parents separated, I have been studying and living at an expensive boarding school paid for by my father. My father told me it was so I could meet the right people. I rarely saw my mother after the separation, and if I'm honest, I resented her for leaving my father. I admired my father, but he could get very angry and be hard on me when he was disappointed. During my first Easter break, he told me to make friends with a boy called Eric. He said, Trust me, Eric and his family are well connected and will be good for you. After that, I automatically turned my attention to Eric and it turns out, he was cool and loved basketball like me. Soon, we were spending loads of time together. We became best friends even more so after we were both selected for our school's basketball team. My father told me during one of our phone calls that I should ask Eric if I could spend the last two weeks of summer vacation with him since he had to travel for work. Eric was excited and his parents were happy that he wanted to have a friend over. But when I got home, my father got all serious and said he had to talk to me. He told me that I must never repeat what he was about to say. He told me that Eric's father was a spy. He told me that while I was staying with Eric and his parents, I should load software on their router so that my dad could hack into their computers to see what they were doing. My father explained and showed me everything in detail but then insisted we never speak of it again. I should forget about all of this after I complete my task. After that, my father was in a good mood for the rest of our vacation together. I felt guilty about Eric, but didn't say anything to my father so he wouldn't get angry. Eric was my best friend. How could I betray him like that? I was no longer looking forward to the last two weeks of vacation with Eric. But even so... I felt like I should do what my father had told me. It was not difficult. What if Eric's parents were up to something bad? On the second day, Eric and his parents went shopping for a short time and left me alone in the house. Without a second thought, I uploaded the spyware onto their computer. It only took a few minutes. I felt terrible afterwards. I let Eric down, and he and his parents had been nothing but nice to me. Eric had noticed I wasn't my usual self, too, and asked me what was wrong. He said, friends talk about everything, but I just closed up. Back at boarding school, our friendship was no longer the same as when I was with him. I just felt so bad. Then one day, Eric was picked up by his mother in the middle of class. Shortly afterwards, a classmate told me that his father had been arrested for industrial espionage, that he was a spy. My father had been right. That evening, I had a video call with my father. I told him what had happened at school with Eric. He got angry and said, We don't talk about that, you know that? And he ended the phone call. I was sad and didn't know what it all meant. How could my father just put all this on me and not explain? During the autumn vacations, my father was in a good mood again. He showed me his new car, a very expensive sports car and said we didn't have to worry about money now, and we would start going on great vacations. And the Maldives was amazing. Father was much more relaxed, and we had a lot of fun together. But somewhere deep inside, I still felt guilty over what I'd done to Eric. After I went back to school, a girl from my class, Mia, suddenly sat next to me, where Eric had used to sit. We soon became friends and studied together, laughed about the same things, and shared our struggle with exams. Eventually, we fell in love. It was like it was all meant to be. The next time I Skyped with my father, I was excited to tell him all about Mia, but he didn't share my enthusiasm. Mia who? He asked. When I told him her name was Mia Schneider, he suddenly changed his tune and perked up. He said, From the Schneider's Engineering Group? I told him I didn't care who Mia's parents were, but he was adamant I should. I was irritated because he was so interested in Mia's family. When I came home for Christmas, my father immediately asked me if everything was alright with Mia and me. If I was trying hard enough, I shouldn't mess this up as this could be our big chance. 
For the first time, I answered him back. I told him to stop, that Mia wasn't a chance. She was my girlfriend. I was extremely uncomfortable with his strange views on us. I loved Mia for her, not her family. What was my father actually thinking? He got really angry, so I left it. Fortunately, I spent the second part of my winter vacation with my mother skiing. Unlike with father, I was much happier during this vacation. My disappointment and anger about her leaving seemed to fade. I even told her about Mia, and she was delighted and asked me loads of questions about what she was like. Nevertheless, I was pleased to go back to boarding school so I could see Mia again. I had missed her so much. We loved spending time with each other again. However, the video calls with my father were still awkward and weird. Unexpectedly, Mia's parents invited me to their home for Easter. I was relieved not to have to spend that time with my dad, but how would he take it that I wasn't coming home for Easter? I was not prepared for what happened the next time I spoke with my father. He was overjoyed when he heard that I was going to spend Easter with Mia. Then he got very serious and said I needed to take this opportunity to do again what I had done back at Eric's house. I was shocked and asked if he really thought Mia's father was a spy. That's when he turned ice cold and angrily told me not to be so naive. Where did I think the money for my school or the vacations came from? We are the spies. He said this was the chance of a lifetime and I couldn't ruin it. He even threatened that I wouldn't be able to see Mia again if I didn't do it. So, I agreed, just wanting this horrifying conversation to end. There was no way I would do that to Mia. But I was also terrified of my father. How could he put his own son in this position? I was miserable. I felt really sick and didn't go to class. For two days, I thought about the situation. Mia called during that time. Of course, but I told her I would explain everything as soon as possible, that I wasn't really sick, but there was a problem in my family that I needed to take care of. Then, I made a decision. I asked my mother to go to the police with me, that I would explain everything to her in person. She arrived in the evening. I told her everything, about Dad making me spy on Eric and now Mia. The next morning, we went to the police together, and had a very long conversation with an officer of the Special Economic Crime Unit. A few hours later, the police installed a camera in my room. Two officers and my mother were with me when I called my father. I was shaking inside. I told him I would do what he wanted, but only if he told me everything about Eric's family. He resisted at first, but then had no choice, because I threatened to go to the police if he didn't. At first, he laughed said I would never have the guts to do that. I'm not a kid anymore, I said, and I want to know as much as you do, or no deal. I asked him question after question, and he explained everything. With this evidence, the CID convicted my father and those working alongside him. I'm sure it will take me a long time to process how my father manipulated me into doing what I did. I know I did the right thing by going to the police. Eric's father got his job back, and Eric came back to boarding school. We talked it out, and after a long while, we found our old friendship again. Eric now understands that at first I trusted my father more than him and his family. And the best thing, Mia and Eric get along great. Above all, my relationship with my mother has gotten much better. Of course, she hadn't known that my father had become a criminal, but she had suffered from his distance and personality change, but didn't want to burden me with it. Hello, I'm Tim, and I'm 13 years old. In the last few months, I've been stealing from my parents. <laughs> of course, I didn't think of it that way at first. I thought it was just things they didn't need that were just lying around. Things that were there and could be put to better use. But it's best if I tell you the story from the beginning. My parents are actually pretty okay. They were proud that I was campaigning for climate action and that I was involved with an orphanage in Africa. My parents always agreed with me when I said that the world is very unfair and the level of poverty on our planet is unbearable. 
Even when I asked them if they thought that we should do more to help those who are worse off, they agreed with me. At first, they were also always open to me asking them for donations for various projects. As time went by, however, they became more and more reluctant to give me anything and said that it was the other parents' turn to donate. Then we had quite an argument. It was about the printing costs for a flyer calling for a climate demonstration. I asked my parents to cover the missing amount, but they said they simply didn't have the money. So I said, then let's sell something. We have so many things that would be good to sell and that none of us would miss. That's enough now. We're not going to sell our stuff. And you're wrong. We would miss them. I don't want to hear about it anymore. My mother said very angrily. But I will, I objected. But my father also said that he'd heard enough and the discussion ended there. A few days later, I read that a storm destroyed the roof of the school at the African orphanage I'm involved with. They desperately needed money for a new roof. I knew I couldn't ask my parents. They had just said no and would get annoyed if I asked them again. Yet we had so much unnecessary stuff. I wanted to prove to them that they wouldn't miss any of it. And I was helping. A school was much more important than useless things in drawers and cupboards. Right after my tutoring session, I was home alone and went through some drawers. I found a wallet with money in a foreign currency, a camera that hadn't been used in a long time, and a gold coin. I put the camera and the gold coin on an auction site. I took the money to the bank and exchanged it, just like the coins from my piggy bank. I deposited the money in my bank account and transferred it directly to the orphanage's account. The camera and the gold coin sold straight away, which brought in more money to my account. I immediately sent it on. It was really convenient that my parents went shopping for my grandparents every Wednesday after work. I got tutoring at home on those days from Nina, an older <laughs> girl from my school. But there was still enough time afterwards to wrap the packages and take them to the post office without my parents noticing anything. Unfortunately, the money we collected was still not enough for the roof of the school. So, I went back home to look for things that no one would miss. In the basement, I found my father's skis. He didn't ski anymore anyway after a skiing accident two years ago. There was also a pocket watch in the very back of a drawer in his wardrobe that I'd never come across before. At the very bottom of my mother's wardrobe, I found a bag and shoes under some shoe boxes. They looked brand new and I'd never seen them before either. I took pictures of the things with my phone and put them back up for sale on the auction platform. The skis, the bag and the shoes brought in quite a bit too. The big surprise was the price of the pocket watch. It had been auctioned off for over a thousand euros. I was super happy. <laughs> I immediately transferred the money to Africa and started packaging everything. The skis were picked up from our house. I arranged for the buyer to collect on a Wednesday when my parents were out shopping as usual. I took the money to the bank the next morning and transferred it again. A few days later, enough money had been raised to repair the school roof and I'd played a big part. I was very happy. Shortly after, I read that the captain of a rescue ship had been sued. She had rescued some refugees from drowning and brought them ashore without permission. Donations were urgently needed for the costly lawsuit. For a long time, I had been annoyed at how little politicians cared that so many people were drowning in the Mediterranean, and I couldn't understand why they weren't doing more about it. Again, I searched in all possible corners and was very surprised when I found a backpack in the attic 
with all kinds of things from my late grandma. Photos and letters, but also jewellery. My grandma didn't need this jewellery anymore, and my parents didn't seem interested in it. So I decided to photograph the jewellery as well, and auction it off. The following Wednesday, my tutoring class was over and Nina had just left. But I could still hear her voice outside our house. I went outside and saw two police officers talking to her. She kept saying no loudly and was obviously very upset. A short moment later, my parents arrived. They were back home much earlier than usual. It took me a moment to understand what was going on. My parents had probably noticed that more and more things went missing at home and considered Nina as the only suspect, even though they hardly knew her. To catch her in the act, they had informed the police. I ran over and shouted, No! Stop! Nina has nothing to do with this! My parents were horrified! They apologised to Nina and the police. Then they had a lengthy conversation with me. They were very disappointed, but also said that they took some responsibility for what happened. They wanted to know everything in detail. Of course, I had to take down my grandmother's jewellery from the auction immediately. When I told my mother that I hadn't sold the jewellery yet, she was very relieved and said that she had only put this backpack away with grandma's things because the memories still hurt too much. My father was shocked that I didn't see it as stealing at all. These are not your things, and we decide for ourselves what we do and don't do with our things, he said sharply. Even if we understand how unfair it is that children don't have a school roof or books, he added. You can talk to us and convince us, but you can't go over our heads and decide for us. That is not only stealing, but also very disrespectful and unfair, my mother said. All three of us were sad, and my parents said they were still thinking about the consequences of all this. That same evening, we went to Nina's house and asked her to apologise again. My parents said they had made a big mistake and shouldn't have just suspected Nina. <sighs> Nina still didn't want to tutor me anymore, which upset me even more, but I could understand why. The next day, my parents told me the three consequences of my behaviour. One, I had to give up one third of my pocket money for the rest of the year. Two, my parents would go to my room right after our conversation and take seven things of some value. They would sell them and donate the amount to an organisation of their choice. Three, from now on, there would be one evening every week when we would do nothing but talk about anything that seemed important to us. I was quite taken aback. I had to stay in the living room while my parents went to my room to pick out things to sell. They came back with my skateboard, my track trophy, my grandma's little table lamp and my four football scrapbooks. All things I no longer used or rarely used, but nonetheless I was still very attached to them. It was hard to swallow, but... I guess that's how they felt about the things I had taken from them. They actually auctioned everything off and donated the amount raised to an organisation that takes care of young offenders. I started to see things from their point of view, and even though I had good intentions, I realised I was in the wrong, and I now understand it is often really difficult to judge what is important or valuable to someone else. Hi, I'm Rosie. I'm 14. Thanks so much for joining me and listening to my story of how cutting corners on my chores became something much more serious. You have to listen to what I did so you don't make the same mistake. This is my house. There's plenty of windows, right? Well, there's plenty of people. First, let me introduce you to my family. First, there's mom and dad. My sister Shelly is 19. I hardly see her because she studies all the time. My brother Aaron is two years older than me, and he likes to be noisy. They don't always get along. <laughs> then there's me. Then there's my 10-year-old brother, Charlie. Next is Olivia. She's eight. She loves to paint. Then there's Bobby. 
he's five. And the baby of the family, at least until my parents have more, is Sienna. She just turns three. That's right. My parents have seven children so far. They just love kids. There are some bad things about coming from a large family. I've never been on a plane because the tickets would cost too much for all of us to travel. In the summer, we mostly just stay home. But there are enough of us to play some pretty cool games. We are experts at hide and seek. <laughs> One of the bad things about living with this many people is the food. If you open a basket of biscuits in this family, it's gone immediately. And that a lot of people eating a lot of food means a lot of dishes. And we're super fussy eaters. Shelly pretty much lives on crisps. Aaron can't get enough chicken. Bobby has allergies. Mom is vegan. And Sienna loves cucumber. But only if it's cut into discs. In fact, if you want her to try anything new, you pretty much have to cut it into a circle. Charlie, Dad, and me eat pretty much everything. My dad said once that if he kept the dishes clean all the time, then he'd never have a chance to cook us any food. Thankfully, we have a dishwasher. Everyone in our house does chores, even Bobby. And it's my job to load and unload the dishwasher. It used to be Shelly's job, but she's got super important exams, so now the dishes are my responsibility. Everyone knows to put the dirty dishes on one side and get clean dishes from the other side. We don't put them away. We use them too fast for that. It's exhausting. There's just never a time when everything is clean. One day in the summer, we were having an epic game of hide and seek when mom called out, Rosie, dishwasher's finished. I went to the kitchen, annoyed that I was missing the game. I quickly got all the clean dishes out and piled them up on the side. Then I chucked all the dirty dishes in. They were more than usual because Aaron was teaching himself how to cook. His dish of the week was southern fried chicken. However, it was a miracle. I nearly got everything in. There was just one bowl left. I looked at it. It looked clean. I knew that Olivia had been painting earlier that day. I thought she used the bowl to wash her brushes. I was kind of annoyed. Even though it was my job to do the dishes, she was old enough to tidy up after her hobbies. I rinsed the bowl for two seconds in some cold water and moved it to the clean side of the kitchen. I had finally done the dishes. I raced back to join the game of hide-and-seek. Pretty soon, Dad called out, hands at the ready, which is his dad way of telling us to wash our hands before we eat. We had slices of tomato, bread rolls, meat, and cucumber. Slices of banana and some cheese. Sienna wouldn't try the cheese until Bobby cut it into the right shape with a cookie cutter. And some of us had the chicken that Aaron had made. It was delicious. Dad joked that he should be a chef when he grows up, but Aaron said, There's no need. When I'm a famous rock guitarist, I'll employ a chef. Pretty soon after that, everyone got sick. Mom got sick. Aaron got sick. Olivia got sick. Bobby got sick. It was awful. Just when we thought everything had calmed down, Sienna got sick. They were sick for about three days. Then, thankfully, everyone began to get better. Everyone except Sienna. She just couldn't eat or drink anything, not even water, until Mom realized there was only one thing to be done. It was awful. Mom and Dad were so worried. I'd never seen them looking so frightened. Once she was in the hospital, Sienna got a lot better really fast because they put fluids inside her to help the dehydration. Then they did a bunch of tests. And then they discovered she had a kind of food poisoning called Campylobacter. You can get it a few different ways, but one of the most common is from chicken that hasn't been cooked properly. But Sienna doesn't eat chicken, said Mom. She only eats things that are round. The doctors asked us to think back to what we had eaten before everyone got sick. The whole family thought as hard as they could. Aaron looked super guilty. Mom, he said, do you think my fried chicken made Sienna sick? Mom looked at Dad. The chicken was cooked all the way through, said Dad. We tested it really carefully. And anyway, said Mom, I got sick and I didn't eat the chicken. Who ate the chicken? I asked. We worked out that Dad, Charlie, me, and Aaron had all had chicken for lunch. The doctor asked, what else did you have that day? Cucumber, said Mom. We have cucumber with every meal. But people can't get sick from cucumber, I said. Can you believe it was the cucumber that made everyone sick? 
But sure enough, we worked out that everyone who got sick had eaten the cucumber. I still didn't understand how my family had gotten so sick from cucumber when the doctor said, this bacteria can also spread through the juices of raw chicken if you don't wash all the dishes properly. What? I said. We have a dishwasher. I just load and unload. And then I remembered. The bowl. For a moment, I considered not telling my family what I had done. But I knew I would never live with myself if I didn't tell the truth. The bowl with the purple stripe, I said. I thought Olivia had just used it for painting, so I just quickly rinsed it. And Aaron looked horrified. The bowl with the purple stripe? I put the chicken in it before I did the spices. Oh, Rosie, said Mom, so sadly. Somehow, the fact that she was sad was worse than if she'd been angry. I started to cry. Mom, I said, I'm so sorry. I just wanted all the dishes to be clean. I didn't think I could feel any worse than at that moment. But I could, because just then, Sienna said, Mommy, my legs feel all funny. The doctor said, Everybody out, and we watched through the window. The doctor asked Sienna to move her legs, to try and get out of bed, but she couldn't. She couldn't move her legs at all. She was paralyzed. They had to do a bunch more tests. And then the paralysis spread to her arms. Sienna had a rare reaction to the Capybolacter bacteria. It can be very serious. Her own nervous system was attacking her. Mom and Dad were at the hospital all the time, and we went in for visiting hours every single day. Thankfully, Sienna was really lucky. The paralysis only lasted two weeks. But I can tell you, it was the longest two weeks of my life. When she came back home, she was pretty much back to normal. Except, because hospital food comes in all shapes and sizes, she learned to eat things that aren't round. Now, she likes things in all shapes and sizes. And me? I learned never to cut corners on my chores. So, that's how I poisoned my family and paralyzed my sister. We're super lucky that she didn't die. Have you ever cut corners on your chores? Let me know in the comments. I'm sure I can't be the only one. And here? Thankfully, things are pretty much back to normal. I'm coming to find you! Ha <laughs> ha!